we look at reabsorption in the proximal convoluted tubule in a different video called reabsorption. In this video, what I'd like to do is I'd like to look at reabsorption that occurs in the loop of Henle and also take a look at secretion and finish up talking about urine production. So if we look at uh, reabsorption in the loop of Henle, uh, this particular um, mechanism, the reabsorption that occurs there, it's known as the countercurrent multiplier mechanism, which is a uh, mouthful. Um, this term countercurrent uh, is just referring to the fact that the filtrate flows down the descending limb of the loop of Henle, and at the same time, we have filtrate flowing up the ascending limb. That's all. Okay, so the countercurrent is just that opposite uh, flow that we have in the flow direction and the descending and the ascending limb. The multiplier mechanism has to do with uh, the fact that what's happening in the descending limb is kind of um, enhancing what's happening in the ascending limb and vice versa. So let me show you what we mean. In the proximal convoluted tubule, recall water is being passively reabsorbed by osmosis. And the same thing here in the descending limb. So what you see in the descending limb of the loop of Henle is just a continuation of what you saw in the proximal convoluted tubule, which is that the descending limb is permeable to water, and so water continues to be reabsorbed uh, in the descending limb. That's not the case in the ascending limb. Uh, in the ascending limb, it's, there is no water being reabsorbed, but we're using active transport, we're using energy to reabsorb sodium. So we know that 70% of the sodium was reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule, and here's an additional amount of sodium that we're going to use energy to extract out of the um, filtrate. So let's think about this. Taking a look at a different picture. Um, what they're showing us in this picture is just a continuation of the exact same story that we were looking at. So I see in the descending limb that water is being passively reabsorbed into the blood. And what they're showing me is that as that happens, look at the concentration of the filtrate. The concentration of the filtrate is becoming greater and greater. That makes sense, right? Because water is leaving, salt is not leaving which means that the water left behind in the filtrate is becoming more and more and more salty, more concentrated, so that by the time you reach the bottom of the loop of Henle, that filtrate is the most concentrated. Now, in the ascending limb, what we're doing is we're using energy to kick that salt out. So do you see how as we reabsorb salt, the concentration of salt gets lower as you move up the ascending limb? And the multiplier mechanism just means that as we spend energy, to take salt out of the ascending limb, that's going to make the interstitial fluid and the blood of this area more concentrated, and that's going to attract more water out of the descending limb. And so one is kind of driving the other. As we take water out of the descending limb, it makes the filtrate more salty, right? And then we uh, actively remove that salt. And as we actively remove that salt, it makes this environment more salty, and so more water is removed by osmosis in the descending limb. And so that's the basics of the counter uh, current multiplier uh, mechanism in the loop of Henle. So that by the time the filtrate hits the distal convoluted tubule, most reabsorption has occurred. And so just to summarize, Taking a look at a chart from our book, what they do is they look at the um, reabsorption occurring in different segments. So let's take a look at the reabsorption that occurred in the proximal convoluted tubule. We talked about that in the other video. So sodium, I know it's going to be actively reabsorbed, about 70% of it in the proximal convoluted tubule. We want to take the nutrients back, right? So the glucose should be taken back by active transport, amino acid taken back by active transport. So we're going to uh, take those nutrients back. Uh, when sodium comes back actively, that's going to power the reabsorption of other ions, which follow passively. Water will also follow passively by osmosis. And that's the basic story of what's occurring in the proximal convoluted tubule. Looking at the loop of Henle, that's what we just looked at in this video. In the descending limb, water is uh, reabsorbed passively. But then in the ascending limb, we spend uh, energy, right, to actively transport salt, and that enhances the passive reabsorption of water. Taking a look at the distal convoluted tubule, 
and the collecting duct, which I haven't talked about yet, uh, the reabsorption that occurs in, in this area is primarily uh, driven by hormones. So here they're talking about the uh, reabsorption of sodium. So what we know so far is 70% of sodium is uh, reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule, and then additional sodium is reabsorbed actively in the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, right? And so when you hit the distal convoluted tubule, if aldosterone is present, then you'll have additional sodium retention. If aldosterone is not present, then I won't get that additional sodium retention, but that's where aldosterone is having its effect. As far as calcium reabsorption, that could occur if parathyroid hormone is present. And so you can see this is really hormonally driven. Uh, we could have water retention, additional water retention, if ADH is present. And so you wouldn't have water uh, retention occurring there unless we have ADH present. Uh, you could see potassium secretion. And again, that potassium secretion is aldosterone dependent. And so for every sodium we retain, we secrete a potassium into the filtrate. So this brings us to the topic of secretion. And it would be great if there was one localized region where secretion occurs, but actually secretion occurs in various regions of the tubule. Remember, secretion is the movement of a uh, substance, a solute, from the blood into the tubule. So in other words, something that didn't get filtered is getting put into the tubule. And so to take a look at um, just a summary picture from our book, in blue, they're highlighting reabsorption. In green, they're highlighting secretion. And so I'm just going to take a look at um, secretion. So we know that potassium could be secreted into the tubule, and that would be tied to aldosterone. That occurs in the distal convoluted tubule. Could also occur in the um, collecting duct. And then the other secretion I want to point out is hydrogen ions can be secreted, and those are secreted into the proximal convoluted tubule, and that has to do with pH regulation, which we'll talk more about in class. But after filtration, reabsorption, and secretion occur, what's exiting out of the collecting duct is urine. And so urine is basically water, right? Water with some electrolytes. It can contain amino acids that depends on dietary intake. And then the other components of urine, like urea, uric acid, and creatinine, are uh, waste products, which is exactly what urine is, right? A means to get rid of some waste products. Here's a little uh, table of what should not be in urine. And so just to look at a few things that we've talked about, we know that glucose, because we regulate that hormonally, should not spill over into the urine. Whole proteins shouldn't even get filtered, right? So whole proteins should not be there. We might see amino acids there, like we were saying, but not whole proteins. Uh, we also shouldn't see blood cells. Those are too big to get filtered. And so if we do see the presence of blood cells, then we're, you know, wondering why. And as far as the volume of urine, that really depends on uh, how much fluid intake you have but it's usually anywhere between a little over a half of a liter to two and a half liters per day. It depends on how much fluid you're taking in, like I said, and also how much fluid you're losing through other means. And so, you know, what's the temperature? What's the humidity? How much are you losing in sweat? Uh, what's your respiratory rate? Because we lose a little bit of fluid with exhalation. And so depending on, you know, what other fluid loss you have, that can affect the volume of urine. 